Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Abdurrahman Rusi and this video will be focused on an approach to spine imaging. Starting off with some anatomy basics, we'll go through one by one the different regions of the spine and some important characteristics of each. The cervical spine consists of seven vertebrae, with C1 and C2 receiving special names, C1 being the atlas and C2 being the axis. The cervical spine is unique in that it contains eight nerve roots for seven vertebrae and they are named differently than they are in the rest of the spine. For example, the nerve root in between C6 and C7 is referred to as the C7 nerve root. Lastly, the cervical spine has two important joints, the atlanto-occipital joint, which is between the base of the skull and C1, and the atlanto-axial joint, which is in between C1 and C2. These joints have important implications, especially in traumatic subluxation or dissociation. Unlike in the cervical spine, the thoracic and lumbar spines both have equal numbers of vertebrae and nerve roots, 12 and 5 respectively. Here onwards, the naming convention differs, for example, between T3 and T4, the T3 nerve root comes out. It is also important to know where the spinal cord terminates. For adults, it's around L1, and for children, L2 to L3. The terminal bulbous part of the spinal cord is termed the conus medullaris, and the remaining nerve endings and nerve roots coming off the cord resemble a horse's tail, hence the term cauda equina. Lastly, the sacral spine consists of five fused vertebrae with an attached tailbone termed the coccyx. Going over some basic anatomy of the vertebrae, on the left here we have a vertebra as viewed from above. We have the vertebral body here in the anterior portion and it is connected to the posterior portion via the pedicle. The posterior portion consists of the transverse process and the spinous process connected by the lamina. On this posterior lateral view, we have the superior articular process and the inferior articular process. The area in between, not shown here, is the pars interarticularis. More on this later. Here is some important vocabulary. The root word spondylo is Greek for vertebra. So right off the bat, we know we're dealing with the spine. As you may already know, spondylitis is inflammation of the spine. Spondylosis is degenerative changes of the spine commonly due to osteoarthritis. Spondylolysis is a strex fracture defect of the pars interarticularis, the area which I showed you in the previous slide. Spondylolisthesis is a displacement of one vertebra over another, and this is commonly due to spondylolysis. And we have radiculopathy and myelopathy. Radiculopathy is nerve root disease, and myelopathy is any disease or injury of the spinal cord. Back pain is an extremely common symptom that even you may have experienced at some point. It is estimated that the lifetime prevalence may be as high as 84% in adults. Most cases can be treated conservatively with activity modification or NSAIDs, but what about the patient with persistent symptoms or red flags? When do you image these patients, and which imaging modality do you use? If conservative management fails after about four to six weeks, then oftentimes your PCP will obtain a screening x-ray to rule out something obvious. However, certain patients with red flags may require imaging sooner than four to six weeks. Broadly speaking, these are the patients with significant trauma, neurological exam finding, signs of infections, or malignancy. Over the next few slides, I will introduce some of the more common imaging modalities for the spine, as well as some example indications and images. Firstly, we have the plain radiograph. This is often first-line imaging for patients with chronic back pain and no red flags. It is cost-effective, has low radiation, and is relatively quick. X-ray machines are commonly found in places like urgent cares, PCP offices, and emergency departments. It is a good tool to look for large fractures, deformities, and malalignment, but can miss some of the more subtle findings. This should not be first-line imaging for significant trauma, as it has relatively poor sensitivity as shown here, as compared to CT, which has a sensitivity in the high 90s. Lastly, it has poor soft tissue detail and should not be used to assess ligaments, discs, or the spinal cord. Here are a couple example images of some pathology you may encounter on a plane radiograph. On the left, we have a vertebral body fracture, as indicated by the arrow sign. On the right, we have a case of advanced cervical spondylosis, which is common in older patients. 
CT is the gold standard for evaluation of bony anatomy and is first line for suspected spine trauma. It is more costly, has a higher radiation burden than x-ray, and takes roughly the same amount of time as an x-ray. It is available in most, if not all, emergency departments and even some urgent care centers. It has improved soft tissue detail compared to x-ray, but it is outperformed by the MRI. One takeaway from this is that if you find a single spine fracture anywhere in the spine, then it is an indication to scan the rest of the spine. Here are some example images of CT scans. On the left, we have a case of spondylolysis as evident by the bilateral pars interarticularis fractures here, leading to an unstable fracture. This fracture over time can lead to spondylolisthesis, which is slippage of one vertebral body over another. There are some instances in which a CT scan requires contrast. CT contrast is iodinated, so make sure your patient is not allergic. Here are some example studies with common indications. CT angiography, aka the CTA, is indicated in stroke patients, trauma patients, amongst others. A CT spine study with contrast is typically reserved for patients with suspected malignancy or infection. A CT myelogram is when contrast is directly injected into the spinal canal and a CT is quickly performed. This is often reserved for patients with contraindications to MRI. Our last imaging study to discuss today is the MRI, everyone's favorite. It requires no radiation but comes at the great cost of time and money. You also run the risk of requiring sedation, oftentimes in pediatric patients or patients unable to tolerate the study. MRI's main purpose is to evaluate the soft tissues and it provides excellent detail of the musculature, intervertebral discs, ligaments, and the spinal cord itself. Here are some example MR images. On the left, we have osteoblastic metastases to the vertebral column as shown here. On the right, we have a case of canal stenosis in the cervical spine as indicated by the arrow sign. As you can see, MR provides both great bony detail and excellent soft tissue detail. There are several indications for MRI with contrast. Recall MR contrast is gadolinium based, which is not iodinated, but patients can still have an allergy to it. MR angiography or MRA is for patients with a contraindication to CTA, as CTA is often preferred as it is cheaper and faster. For pediatric patients, we typically want to avoid irradiating them unless we have to, and therefore we prefer MRA to CTA in these patients. For patients with suspected or confirmed malignancy or infection, MRI with contrast is an option. To recap, the main takeaway is to consider all the factors that go into play when ordering an exam for evaluation of the spine. This includes the patient's symptoms, if they have any red flags, and secondarily, we want to think about the cost, radiation, and the time it takes to conduct the exam. A good clinician knows when to order the correct imaging study. For example, a patient with months of back pain and no red flags, start them off with an x-ray. A patient who was just in a motor vehicle collision with prolonged extrication would require a CT scan of their entire spine. An MRI is reserved for patients with unrevealing imaging studies or those with concern for malignancy, infection, or soft tissue injury. If unsure, consider referencing the ACR appropriateness criteria. Thank you for your time.